Hello, and welcome to the FilmsetGeek.com podcast. Interviews with experts across all disciplines of film and TV production. Sponsored by Axis Grip Hungary, professional aerial filmography and stabilised rig and grip services. I'm Steve Collison, and my guest today is comedian, actor, author, and Teletubby, Dave Thompson. Dave started his career as a stand-up comedian in the mid-1980s and moved into television with the role of Tinky Winky in the world-conquering kids' show Teletubbies between 1997 and 2001. Although Dave has spent most of his career as an international stand-up comedian, he has kept a toe in film and TV, having worked with Harry Hill, most notably appearing in the Harry Hill movie in 2013, and appearing in Ben Elton's film Maybe Baby in 2000. Dave has also written a novel, The Sex Life of a Comedian. We're delighted that Dave could stop by today to tell us about his role as a Teletubby. Welcome, Dave. Hello. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. We usually ask our guests to describe their profession in their own words, and we'll make no exception today. So could you tell us exactly what a Teletubby is? Well, a Teletubby is an alien creature who lives in the place known as Teletubby Land, mm -hmm. and they are reactive in that they don't really initiate things they things appear around them and they respond to them uh, understood and um and how do they live their lives well they have a mental age of about three yeah and they love to cuddle and eat tubby custard and tubby toast yes and otherwise they don't really understand very much they're sort of like clowns yes. and they're aimed for children from the age of zero to about three years old and, and historically, university students as well. Well, there was also, yes, an extra collateral, um, if that's the right word, yes. audience. Yes. They, it was originally shown in Britain about six o'clock in the morning, because that's when people with very young children are being woken up by their very young children. Yeah. And that's also the time when clubbers are returning from <laughs> nightclubs yeah. and turning the TV on. Yeah. So it became quite a cult program for people who were sort of just got back from a rave and were coming down off their ecstasy tablets. Yeah. And also, apparently, the gay community adopted Tinky Winky as a sort of a gay icon. Yeah. Yeah. Because of the purple costume, which apparently purple colour is a gay colour. Uh -huh. <clears throat> He's out, uh, Ariel is triangular, which apparently is a gay symbol. Uh -huh. And he had the red handbag, yes. or as the Americans would say, the red purse. Yes. But what people didn't realise was that, that they are all found objects. The Teletubbies all have a favourite toy. Yeah. Tinky Winky has the red handbag. Right. Um, Lala has the ball, which was actually a balloon. Uh, Dipsy has the hat, and Poe has the scooter. But... Dinky Winky and the others don't know that it's a woman's handbag. As right. far as they're concerned, it's an object that appeared. Right. And uh, Tinky Winky chose it as his favourite toy. Yeah. And are they and the, the four Teletubbies are supposed to be gender neutral? They are gender specific. Okay. Lala and Poe are female. Right. Tinky Winky and Dipsy are male. Okay. But they are pre-sexual beings. I see. Understood. Or probably even asexual beings. Yes. Made for the consumption of of by pre-sexual beings oh, i.e children yes and it's quite important that children should be allowed to have their childhood and uh, be free of that sort of thing Absolutely. um so the teletubbies don't have genitals right important important to note mm -hmm. okay so uh, so thank you for that so then i'd be keen to talk a little bit about your career first then get into into some of the specifics of your role as tinky winky so how did you get into comedy and show business how did it all begin well uh, it is a bit of a cliche, I suppose, because they say that comedians often were deprived of love when they were children. Okay. And so they become a comedian so that they can get lots of attention and laughter and sort of love from an audience, yeah. strangers. Yeah. And my childhood was a very unhappy childhood and very bereft of love. Yeah. So I think that's probably why I went into the attention-seeking world. And, and uh, were you the funny guy in the playground? Yeah, school. I was sort of a, the, the clown at school. Yeah, it was a classic um, situation, really. I wanted to get attention, and I found that if I did things and said things, people would laugh. So I did more of it because it felt good. And did you have a particular shtick, or did you have a particular approach to comedy even at that point? Well, I think I was just probably just being myself 
um, which is a sort of by other people's standards, somebody who has a sort of a left field yeah. way of thinking, you yeah. know, coming at something from an unexpected angle and not being afraid to make a fool of themselves. Um, when my, my mother was told that she'd be dead within three months from cancer when I was about four, and she fought the cancer and lived for about five years, but she was in and out of hospital having major surgery in that time. Yeah. And it sort of became obvious that she was going to die. And then two weeks before she did die, I was told she was going to die. Yeah. And on the morning she died, uh, I was told to be brave and go to school. And I was taken aside from the class on some sort of false pretext, which was obviously a false pretext. Yeah. And I could tell that they were all probably being told, be nice to Dave because his mummy's just died this morning, and then put back in the class. Yeah. And the whole experience of, of, that, uh, of that day, and then when I got home, I was pushed out into the road to play with the other kids. Mm. And I didn't really have a face to put on uh, because I just sort of felt shattered and humiliated yeah. and um, I think that's uh, totally affected my personality the way I behave socially and my comedy which is in a way it's almost like ha having been stripped of all dignity yeah. and any sort of privacy yeah. that there's nowhere to, there's nothing there's nowhere to go there's nothing to lose there's nothing more to lose because if you just had your mother die and then you're told to be brave and go to school yeah there is nothing left. <laughs> right. So, yeah. so why try? Why to put on? Try? Why? Tr why try to have dignity or status or a pr privacy or anything yes. when you've sort of been laid bare in public? Anyway, that's and 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 you. How old were you at this? At this I was nine. Time. It was You're ten right. days yeah. before my tenth birthday. Yeah. yeah. So um, I think that sort of had a massive impact. Yeah. On on the way I am and and who I am. Yeah. And professionally, when did you when did you get up on stage and and give it a go in front of an, a paid audience? Well, I wasn't really very happy at school at all. I yes. had a very very miserable childhood, yeah. and um, I wasn't really good at anything. I was sort of average in English, yes, i.e., you know, story writing stories and things like that. But I wasn't good at anything. Yeah. And then there was this course, a six form course on offer in uh, theatre studies A level. And uh, and I applied to do that and got in. Yeah. And so that sort of got me on the road to uh, doing drama. Yeah. And the guy who wrote the syllabus for the A-level theatre studies course and was the head of department was a man called Gordon Valens, who is a sort of a visionary educationalist. Yeah. And he sort of saw that I was just this shit without a rudder. Yeah. And he guided me and sort of stepped in and nurtured me yeah. and saw what potential I had. And he's now in his late seventies. And if I do a gig near where he lives, he comes to see my gigs. Fantastic. Yeah, and he he, he is uh, still a, a wonderful man. You know, very generous, spirited, and uh, in genuinely interested in in his ex students. Yeah, and this is uh, whereabouts did you did you grow up in England? Well, I grew up in the Midlands. Right. I was I was born in Bristol, yes. and when I was one and a half years old, the family moved up to just near Birmingham. Yeah. Great, and then and then when and then when did you make the transition from that from that theatrical environment into telling the jokes? Well, I took a year off after doing A level theatre studies and lived in squats and was a sort of an apprentice hippie. Right, and then I went to Dartington College of Arts uh, and did a four year degree course in theatre. Yeah, and one of the projects we did during the third year was uh, a cabaret, a surreal cabaret. Okay. And uh, I actually pl played a character called Lionel Deck and told some jokes yeah. on stage during that cabaret. And I didn't actually think of it as stand-up comedy yeah. because the word stand-up comedian wasn't sort of a widely used word, really, in, in that world. It's early, early 80s, are we talking? This would have been the sort of end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s. Got it, yeah. And... Um, so I didn't think of it in terms of doing stand-up comedy or being yeah. a stand-up comedian, but I was on stage holding a mic, telling jokes. Yes. And then a friend of mine who was in the same year as me at the course in Stratford-on-Avon doing A-level theatre studies with Gordon Valens, uh -huh. he was called Ben Elton. Okay. And he was, um, we be sort of became best friends. And then well, he went on to Manchester University and did a degree in drama and met Rick Mayall and Aid Edmondson right. and all that lot. 
and I, I met them all as well when I went up to visit him in Manchester. And then he then started doing this stand-up comedy, this alternative comedy yeah, the, thing. And this was the absolute break, the, yeah. the, the, the wave breaking with the altern yeah. alternative comedy scene in the UK. When, uh, when that exploded, which was yeah. sort of the end of the 70s, I think, about 78, 79. Yeah. What happened was stand-up comedy was sort of a working class medium until then. Yes. It was the, hat, the, the, the roots and the tradition was sort of someone getting up in the pub, doing a few jokes in between people, plonking tunes on the piano, yeah. um, working men's clubs, having yeah. comedians. The famous comedians were largely from, I think, more working class backgrounds than middle class backgrounds. Yeah. And then suddenly these university educated, mostly middle class people came along and said, right, we're now going to rewrite the rules of stand up comedy. Yeah. Thou shalt not say yeah. anything that's sexist or racist yeah. or against handicapped people yes. or whatever. And uh, they changed everything. Yeah. And um, I saw Ben suddenly becoming famous, being on television, yeah. soon afterwards getting quite rich. Yeah. And I thought, hmm, maybe I should have a go. And, uh, and and how did it go? How were your what were your first uh, stand up experiences like? Well, the first time was when Ben was on at the comedy store in London, yep. and they had the guest spot where you could get on and do five minutes. Yes. And I got up and did a few, just told a few jokes. Yep. I remember it was when the announcement had been recently made of Princess Diana and Prince Charles's engagement. Right. And I remember one of the things I said was, uh, I tried to ring Princess Diana, but she was engaged. <laughs> and that was probably one of the best. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, nobody gonged me off, and Ben was sort of expecting me to be gonged off, I think. And, yeah. and I think he was slightly, almost slightly disappointed when I wasn't gonged off, and he was saying, well, normally it's a lot rowdier than that, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, so that I made that attempt. That was when I was still a student at Dartington. Yeah. And then when I left Dartington um, in 1982, it took another three years for me to actually get on stage and decide to become a stand-up comedian and start doing it. And do you see, uh, I mean, uh, it would be reductive to describe your stage persona, but I feel there's a sense of awkwardness about your 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 persona on stage mm. do you see a thread running in terms of your your persona and your style from the early days of your childhood to those first uh, attempts up on stage oh, yeah. it, it's, 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 it's <clears throat> there's a continuum yeah. there's oh, yeah. a continuation. I'm totally the product yeah of my childhood and yeah. that day yes yeah but I, I just use the awkwardness yes as an asset yeah right. rather than allow it to yeah to attract and what do you what do you enjoy most about the the stand up? I enjoy the travel, okay, because it gives you a good excuse to be a wandering bum. Yeah, and I enjoy the fact that I can write material, create material out of nothing. It's it that that it's a limitless resource. Yes. You know, the collective unconscious yes. or the human imagination is limitless in its abundance and yeah. its riches. Yeah, and it's really just a matter of dipping in yeah. and then sort of ordering a bit yes. to create comic material. So an oil person has to go and dig up oil. Yes. You know, a gas person has to go and frack. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> or whatever it is, you know. Um, but my raw material is free, abundant yeah. and not harmful to the environment, yes. apart from the aviation fuel flying me to the gig. Sure, yeah. Um, and to go on and to be solely responsible for the comic idea, yeah. honing it into a, a joke, and then going on stage and then seeing, uh, ideally, a room full of people laughing, yes. and people even coming up to me afterwards and saying that was really funny and that yeah. particular joke was the best of the night, yeah. that's very fulfilling because it's a creative thing, yeah. and there's so much misery and suffering in the world and environmental degradation yeah. that... If we can make people laugh yeah. using a, a limitless resource that's biological yeah, yeah. Um, and, and feel good in ourselves, then everyone is a winner. That's because yeah. if, if comedy is working well, the audience gets a good deal because they get a great night's entertainment yeah. and maybe even a little bit more. Yes. The venue owner does a, gets a good deal because they make money. The yeah. staff get employed to work behind a bar yes. or sell tickets. Yeah. Uh, the comedian gets her ego massage yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and has a fulfilling experience. Yeah. So everybody is a winner. Everyone yes. is, uh, a, has a fulfilling and profitable experience. Yeah. Whereas if you're a professional torturer, yeah. then it's not quite the same. <laughs> right, right. It's almost the opposite, the polar opposite. Of yeah. That. 
Yeah. And um Well I did enjoy my time in Saudi Arabia and uh, <laughs> it was tax free. <laughs> and um do you um do you still get nerves before going up? I can sometimes I can get nerves. The the higher stakes the gig, yeah. the more likely you are to have nerves. Yes. So for example, if you told me um Martin Scorsese is in the audience tonight and he's yeah. scouting around for a tall gangly bloke to be in his next film yeah. <laughs> then I might sort of get a rush of nerves that I otherwise wouldn't have had yeah. because the stakes have been raised I've got more to lose yeah. um, <clears throat> but otherwise what gets me nervous before a gig is when I haven't done a gig for a while because I need to be working regularly yeah. and if I go on and do a gig on a night when I've done gigs on the two previous nights or three or four previous nights, I know I'm going to be funnier yeah. than if I go on and do a gig and I just haven't had done one for two weeks. Yes. Yeah. Because, um, y you know, it's easier to remember the jokes and yes. it's, you're just yes. more in the groove yeah. when, when, when the plane has been flying regularly. And is there, you still get a buzz? Do you, do you get a buzz? Um, it depends, really. I think there's probably no buzz like the buzz being in the dressing room after the gig when it's right. gone well. yeah. Um, because nobody has complete control over whether they're going to do well or not. Yes. And there's always something that could happen, you know, some awkward person in the audience decides to heckle yes. just when you're building up to your punchline yeah. or something. Yeah. Um, it's very nice driving home from the gig. Yeah. If yeah. it's gone really well. Yes, yes. Um, and a, a good gig where you go down really well, even if you have a very late night, you feel energi energised the next day yeah. and you're sort of surfing on that satisfaction. Yeah. And it is fulfilling at a very deep level. You're only as good as your last gig. Yeah, yeah. If the last gig was a bad one, then, you know, life is a bit bad for the next <laughs> few days. <laughs> so then, let's talk Teletubbies. Mm -hmm. First of all, could you tell us, how did you get the role of Tinky Winky in the Teletubbies? Well, I was in every episode of Harry Hill's first TV series, which was called Harry Hill's Fruit Fancies. Okay. And one of the characters that I played was an Egyptian mummy. Right. And when the costume lady put me in the costume, she actually had to sew the bandages across my face. Okay. And I couldn't come out again until she came with the scissors and snipped me open. Right. And people said to me, don't you feel claustrophobic just trapped inside that costume when you can't see properly? Yeah. And you can't even come out until somebody cuts you out, out with some scissors. Yeah. And I said, no, I feel really safe and secure in here. You know, I think maybe I've got an autistic streak. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and somebody who worked on that show, I think he was a runner or something, not much more than that. Yeah. He went on subsequently to become the production manager on the Teletubbies right. and went on after that. The last I heard, he was uh, something like international marketing controller for the BBC, yeah. something like that. Yeah. I know that because I saw him on LinkedIn and applied for his friendship and he blocked me. Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, he, he remembered me and, and he asked me to audition for the Teletubbies. Yeah. And I was one of 600 people who auditioned for the part of Tinky Winky. Wow. And after several recalls, I was given the part. Incredible. And do you know what they were specifically looking for? Yeah. Well, they were they were looking for not what they call skin performers, because um, uh, a lot of there are obviously a lot of those sorts of roles where you know you're playing something other than a human being. Yes. And uh, they call them skin performers, and often they're very short people. Yeah. Um, and they didn't want that. They didn't want people who did skin work. They wanted people who were performers whether it be a comedian or a dancer or an actor, but who had something to give, something to bring, some quality to bring. Right. And they picked the four of us for those reasons. Right. They also wanted it to transcend race. So right. they had a Chinese-British person playing Poe. Yeah. And they had a black British guy playing Dipsy. Yeah. And they had his face slightly darker. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what they wanted. And they, they, we had months of work before we even went in the costumes. Really? Partly because the costumes were late. They, they were being made in America where they had the technology to make two-way stretch fabric to go over the padding. And uh, this fabric was late coming back coming. So we didn't get the costumes until about two months or more after we were supposed to have. Right. Um, and they wanted us to sort of bring our inner child yeah. uh, into the role yeah. and to sort of tap into something deep inside and I found that personally quite um, disturbing really because uh, they, they did that to me and I went in to my little inner child and brought out my three-year-old and yes. 
less less you know was sending out all the love I could and and trying to sort of get to that little innocent bit of inside me. Yeah. And then they um, chewed it up and spat it out and fired me. Okay. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, four years four years later. Um, uh, uh, less than a year later. Oh, really? Yeah. Because you'd over a short period of time, you'd essentially shot uh, multiple yeah, seasons. I, yeah. Of, I, yeah, I actually only worked for them for sort of about a year. Right, which covered... Even less than that. Which covered around 70 episodes. I think so. it was 75 or 76 episodes we made. Yeah. But we worked hard. Yeah. But because we did so much of the generic footage that was shown either in every episode, like the front titles and the end titles, right. or other generic footage that went in some of the episodes, yes. I was actually in every episode that was made in that manifestation of the show. Yes. Because obviously they sold the franchise and it got another different company making it with yeah. different, audio, different um, actors in the costumes. But I was in every one of that first manifestation, which was, I think, 700 and something, or I don't, I don't know how many episodes, 300 and 400 and something. Anyway, I was in all of them. Yeah. My name was in the credits, and yeah. uh, I was on the payroll. Uh, and this was a, w- a one-year period of time. How much work were you doing? So you Monday to Friday, was that the deal? You Monday was, to a 9 to 5, you were Yeah, it was Monday to Friday, but yeah. more than 9 to 5. Yes. I, I mean, I think we probably sometimes, I think we were getting to the set about 7 in the morning or something. Yeah. Yeah, and we'd often go till six or six thirty, or even later, because it was done. It was only it was all done on location. Yeah, in a f- corner of a field. It, where, and whereabouts? Is near that? Stratford-on-Avon, okay. sort of just on just on the edge of the Cotswolds. Yeah, just south of Stratford. Yeah, and um, we the the contracts had had an unlimited overtime clause. Yes. Yeah. So we work very hard. And essentially, the the basic uh, framework of each episode is that it's uh, it's about twenty five minutes long, yeah. and there's the the Teletubbies up to all sorts, predominantly in the fields, and also mm. in in some in interior locations. And then there's a short film that gets played, or a short mini program within it, yeah. which is sort of educational, or it's it's sort of oriented to, to for learning for children. Yeah. And then you said that, and that gets repeated. Yeah, which was a, which was a groundbreaking thing at the time. Yeah. Now the people who made the show were incredibly clever yes. and methodical yeah. and the, the woman who started it she only fell into it because she was working for TVAM and they had falling ratings and she had the idea of introducing Roland Rat right because she, uh, and that was a massive success yeah because that was like very early morning television and a lot of people were getting ready for work and they had young kids yeah. who they were looking after until they took them to the nursery or crash or had the home help arrive or whatever it was and so Roland Rat, they discovered, entertained the kids. Yeah. So if the person is trying to put on their power suit and makeup or whatever it is, and they can stick the kid in front of the telly, and Roland Rat occupied the, the kid, yeah. that was a winner. And that's yeah. what boosted the TV AM ratings. And so she learned, I remember that. Yeah. She learned from that experience <laughs> yeah. that, that a character, like a puppet or something, yes. can engage yeah. children and yeah. keep them occupied. And yeah. one, one thing that, um, that people with young children are very thankful for yeah. is a TV programme that will take them off their hands yes. and they can leave them in front of it knowing that they're not going to wander anywhere. Yeah. They're going to be engaged and they can then get on with making that phone call or doing what they have to do. Yes. So um, so she learned from the Roland Rat thing and went into making ch- ch- TV programmes yeah. for very young children. Yes. And I think at the time, I don't think anybody was actually making them for sort of like babies or, yes. or, right, or right. toddlers. Yes. And she made various programmes. She made Brum... Yeah, I she made that. Tots TV, which was yeah. a big, uh, big winner. Yeah, and she made Rosie and Jim. Yeah, and what she learned from those programs was that um, there's a massive market for children's programs because there's a constant supply of audience being born. Yeah, um, if you've got pu- puppet type creatures that aren't human, yeah, then that that means that they're not any race. Yes, which means they transcend all race. Yes, so you can sell it to Japan. Yeah, right. Africa. Yes. Okay. China. Yeah. You can sell it all over the world. Yes. And they can dub their own. Yeah, yeah. Voices yeah. over. Yes. Yeah. So you've got a big seller. Yes. And she learned from every program, all all those ones she made, and the Teletubbies was a sort of synthesis of yeah, all the things that they'd learned. Yeah. And what they used to do, they they by now they were a very wealthy company, yeah. and they sponsored um, nurseries in all parts of the UK, from Northern Ireland to Cornwall, uh, and these nurseries were specifically chosen so that they had every socio-economic okay. and every sort of racial 
you know national sort of um, representation. Yeah. And they the deal would be that they would give money to these nurseries yeah. in return for the nurseries showing preview tapes of their programmes before they were transmitted. Yeah on a TV with a camera on top filming the kids watching the right. preview tip tape. Yes. And as part of our training as Teletubbies, we watched um, some of these tapes. And there was one where wow. they showed us where the, the, there's a camera sitting on top of the telly and they're filming all these little young little kids in this nursery watching a preview tape. Yeah. And then some of them wander off, a couple of lose, a temp lose attention, yes. and they, they get lost. And then there's another one they showed where they were all transfixed. And they knew that if they their tapes came back from all those nurseries and that they showed a preview tape and that every nursery throughout the UK and Northern Ireland, yeah. the kids were all transfixed, they knew it was a given certainty when it was transmitted, yeah. it would be a hit. Yeah. And Incredible. that's what they did. It's, that's, that's extraordinary. Some market research ahead yeah. of the game and then... Really clever people. Yeah. And then I guess the other part of that synthesis is that there's no voices or, I mean, you've got these um, in, in, indiscriminate or indefinable noises and voices within mm. Teletubbies. So there's no, it's mm. not language based. Well, they would be very offended if they heard you say that. I'm really sorry. The, the, okay. the, 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 every show was scripted. Right. And we had a script read through yes. every morning before right. going on set. And every moment, every OR or runaway yeah. or et -o, uh, was rehearsed it was written and it was rehearsed and it was uh, there for a reason <laughs> but it it, it it sounds a little bit like it's close mm. it's close enough to sort of th certain yeah. noises that that kids would make and yeah this, in this, the english language but it's still it, when it went internationally it was still that they retained that those those words and those voices well people could do whatever they wanted oh, to see. so for yeah. example in yeah. croatia yeah. tinky winky was tinky binky okay because they couldn't really say right. Winky. Right, then they would have had to dub dub over. And so they, and, yeah, yeah, so yes. all those to put their own languages on it. Yeah. But um, that what the this was one of the most controversial things about the program when it first came out was they were saying it's just baby language. Right. And what are the kids learning? Yes. But what they didn't realise was that um, if you want to teach somebody something yes. or get somebody to to develop, yeah, you have to meet them where they are. Yeah. And then go with them to where you want them to be. Yes. Not just go straight into where what you want them to be and bang it, it yeah. impose it on them. Yes. So if the program, and I think the Teletubbies was aiming for an even younger age yeah. range than the previous shows they made. So yes. it was literally for babies yes. up to about three. Yeah. And babies and toddlers, that's the noises, those are the noises they make. So if they want the characters to engage yep. that audience they have to speak in the same way they speak. Yeah. And so all those words which the Teletub is said were actually researched and used for a reason because linguists had said this is the sounds which they can relate right. to. So that's why yeah. it, it attracted so many you know, young kids all over the world yeah. because straight away it was literally speaking their language. Yes. <laughs> yes. To adults it might just be meaning this yeah. gobbledygook, yes. but to the little babies and the toddlers, yeah. it was made sense. Yeah. And that's why they responded so well. And once they've got that rapport going, yeah. then you can start giving them longer words, yeah. which is yeah. what that little educational bit got it. was about. Yes. And the other thing that they learned was that at that age, kids want to see something twice. Because they see it once and then they take something in, yeah. but then there's so much to take in because they're so innocent and they're learning, yeah. and they don't know very much. Yeah. Then you see it a second time to take more in, and that makes them feel secure because on the second viewing, they know yeah. what's coming. Yes. So they feel more sort of in control and, yeah. and, and happy with watching it. So rather than it being um, a waste of time to show the same clip twice, yes. Uh, it was actually useful because they Re reinforcing. It reinforced it and it, and it, it took them along and they, the, the, the audience would um, understand it better. And of course, also, you're selling the same bit of footage twice. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and, so, and it was, a, we'd have be that five minute film with, within the episode. Uh, about five minutes, were, were they about, about five, five minutes? minutes yeah. and they'd repeat it. And then, because I remember yeah. seeing it and going, it, because it's, it's surreal to be watching it as a, an adult yeah. and seeing that repetition, but you are kind of somehow mesmerized by it when you do watch mm. it the second time, even as an adult. And so, 
going back to that, the, the pre-production period, was the role of Tinky Winky very precisely defined or was there scope for invention on your part? Was Were you part of that process of evolving the character to yeah. become what it was? And, and this became. was another thing because they encouraged me to do what I did yeah. and the more I put of myself into it, yeah. the more they encouraged me and the director said, what you're doing is great. And when you're doing a TV show and the director tells you what you're doing is great, you keep doing right. what you've been doing. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it then got used against me okay. and they uh, they fired me. Yeah. Um, there's, it's a bit of a mystery. Some people think that it was all planned from the start as a sort of a publicity right. thing because it did get a huge amount of publicity at the time. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, yeah, she had she had um, her own. She had definite, very set ideas about what she liked and what she didn't like. Yes, and then um, and what was the preparation process like for an episode? You, you mentioned that there was a well-defined script. Re throughs, yeah. And w and when you did those re throughs, they'd be around a table, or it would be rehearsing with uh, movement and blocking. Or well, because because it was um, all done on a field. Yes. It, uh, we had like a little cluster of porter cabins mm -hmm. and so we would sit in the sort of green room area of our dressing room porter cabin yeah and we would sit around with ann wood the yeah. boss um and the, the um first assistant director and the teletubbies and maybe this the writer would all sit around on chairs yes. and read through the script yeah we didn't really have the space to block right. uh, at that point. Yeah. Um, and then once we'd read through the scripts, we'd go out onto the set and they'd be setting up camera angles and stuff. And the way they filmed it was also very uh, innovatory. Right. Um, they had a lot of low-down cameras. Right. They, they had a company, company called TX mm -hmm. provided all the cameras and the camera operators who were very young guys. Yeah. And um, they had, because children are short, yes. they had lots of low-level cameras right. to see it from the kids' right. point of view. And um, they also had quite a few aerial shots. Yeah. And this was obviously before drones. Yeah. And they, they brought in a crane. Right. And the crane... Yeah used to come in after having done Top of the Pops the night before. Right, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and it would, there'd be this, the crew, the same crew would operate the crane. Yeah. And they'd do Top of the Pops in the evening and then they'd drive <laughs> overnight up yeah. to our location and then get it going for about seven in the morning the next day yeah. to film the Teletubbies. Incredible. Yeah. And so um, you've, you've done the prep with the script. How many pages are we? I mean, you, you'd li it'd be literally et o. It would be literally would, there was yeah. a there was a. Uh, There'd be the narrator's voice one yes. day in Teletubby Land. Yes, the narrator was a big got part. It. But the dialect would be written as it as is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it'll be written phonetically. Yeah. Yes, and um, then uh, yeah, that we'd get up and we'd have to. We used to be directed like silent movie style because right. we couldn't see. Yes, the eyes really. were actually like above our heads. I see, and the mouth was at our eye level. Right. So if the mouth was open, you could see. Yes. But if the mouth was closed, you couldn't see. Yeah. yeah. And we controlled the mouth with our right hand. Yeah. And we had a thing like a, almost like the brake on a on a push bike. Yeah. That we pulled with the f the fingers, and that would open and close the mouth. Yeah. And then the eyes would blink with the left hand. A I similar see. thing like the brake on a yeah. on a push bike. Yeah. And that would pull wires, which would operate the eyes and the mouth. Yeah. And the guy who maintained them had previously worked on uh, RAF Phantom Bombers. He'd been in the RAF. Really? And he said the technology of the Phantom fighter bombers and yeah. the Teletubbies was quite similar yeah. because it was basically a pair of pliers and a yeah. wire. Yeah. And if the wire snapped, which it sometimes would, yeah, you had to it was, yeah. rig the wire in. And when, when the wires did go with the eyes, the eyes would just go up. <laughs> <laughs> it would look really weird and sinister, yeah. like they just died. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> So this would have been a lot of the months that you, of preparation was really getting to yeah. grips with this so that it became second nature. Because there were lots the of problems, because it was so innovative in so many ways. Yes. Because um, no one, I don't think, had really had these sort of costumes like, yeah. like they were. Yeah. But they spent £35,000 on each costume. Wow. Um, and they were really specific and very vigorous in the way they... You know, rejected things, and and yeah. and so there was a lot of uh, innovation there. Yeah. There was innovation in the camera angles, yes, and the way it was filmed. Yeah, uh, doing it all on location. Yeah, do all the internals being not on the location. The only bit that wasn't was the front titles and the end titles, which was a green screen shoot at Television uh, Centre in okay. London. Yes, um, 
but it took a long time and they were way behind schedule yes. and way over budget and she mortgaged a house wow. that she'd bought with all the money from the other TV shows yeah. and she said that they were hoping to get 15 minutes a day yeah. of, of actual usable footage right and in the early times they were getting about six to seven minutes a day yeah and that's a big crew that, I mean, that's even a lot for you know, yeah on film film mm. terms. That's six is a lot, but fifteen. Yeah. Did he? Did you ever push it up? Did it Even, get above? Eventually, yeah. Eventually, we did, yeah. And that's just every, lot, everyone in Symphony. You guys knew what you mm, had to do. A lot and, of people yeah. get, getting fired. Yes, yeah. <laughs> a lot of people got sacked on that show. Yeah. Heads every so often, the axe would come out, and a few heads would roll. Yes. And how was it inside? I mean, how was it in, in the costume? You say you had limited visibility and there was choreography between, the synchronised choreography between all four of you. Yeah. How was it to well, that was old, old manage so all of that? At the beginning, it was old silent film person with a megaphone. Right, I see. Left, two, two steps, three. yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, forward, two, three. Yeah, yeah. Um, with the windmill, you know, yeah. it would be... Uh, it would be stop two three windmill two three yes uh oh yeah. or uh oh yeah um, and then later on they introduced little mics and um, earpieces oh really so that it was so just that we you, just yeah. be told that way yeah um, they had to double the voices on later because of the mechanical sound of the jaws oh, moving yeah. but we did all the scripts yes uh, in real time yeah so that it would be easier to then dub yeah. it on later. And there are moments where the Teletubbies get to run around a little bit. Were there moments which were a little bit more free, where you could just go a bit nuts, or was it really bit, heavily because choreographed? Because they were so big. I mean, I was eight eight foot tall with my aerial, because yeah. it was so big. Yeah. And when a Teletubby running, you know, it's a bit like a rhinoceros, it had quite a lot of momentum, and you didn't want to be in the way. Yeah. And any camera equipment that might be in the way would probably not be able to be used again. Yeah. So there wasn't that much room for interpretation and free and in, um, yes because of the frames and stuff and all the other constraints yeah i bet i bet and in terms of the film craft going on around you if you were shoot, shooting a scene were they shooting with multiple cameras yeah or, yeah yeah they did they they use i think three cameras uh at least yeah and sometimes four yeah they had a wide yeah they have close-ups. Yes. It was, um, yeah, they had a lot of cameras. Yeah, all, all coverage. And do you know, were they shooting in, in on film? They were shooting in film. I think it was high minutes? definition. Oh, I think it? it was the first high def, no, very early days of high definition. Right, okay. Because they were Sony still... cameras, Sony yes. HD cameras. Yeah. Yeah. And so you, you did the, the whole thing in a really compact period of time then. So mm. how many weeks of straight shooting was there, if um, you can recall? I think it started probably in about April. March yeah. or April, and yeah. it finished on the first of November. Yeah, uh, and uh, and it was all shot. I mean, it was a majority of the out exteriors were all shot out in fields, actually li li out in literally the, in the corner of a field. Yeah, yeah on and, a farm. and and the and, uh, the weather must have had a major effect. On well, we were lucky with the weather because it was a long hot summer. But yeah. for some strange reason, they always seem to film. Um, internal shots on the hot sunny days and external shots yeah, on the rainy right. days. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And was there any, uh, I mean, so, so <coughs> if it was raining, you could not do it. If, no, so they'd it have uh, you know, all the umbrellas and stuff. Then it stops raining, then you keep going. Yeah, yeah. Right, okay. And the, But does the sky is always, was it, what, did they do any post post work on that? They the, did quite a lot of post work, yeah, yeah, they were big on that as well. Yeah, so mm. they fixed all the, the sky with the, with the background. And you'd be in that costume from eight to, basically eight or six each day, or how? Quite did... a lot of the time. You'd come yeah. out at lunchtime. Yeah. Uh, there were there were two degrees of being in costume. Yeah. The first was being in the main costume. Yeah. Which was very big and padded. Yeah. Um, and not with the head on. Yes. And then the second degree would be to have the head on. Right. And so often there would be a cry, heads off. Yeah. Which would mean that we would do a break. Yeah. And so now you can stand down out of shot, and you can, we can take they can take the heads off. Yeah. Um. The next degree beyond that would be you can come out of the costume and go and have a wee. Yeah. You didn't really need to because you sweated it all out. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, and otherwise you'd be stood down but with the head on, yes. which would mean that you could be ready in a few seconds to go back in, in uh, on camera. And, and was, it, was, it, was it fun? Did you it enjoy the process? It was great fun. In the, early, in the early days it right. was great fun. Yeah. Uh, not least of all because there was a euphoric atmosphere on the set. Yes. Because we knew, having seen these 
filming of yeah. filming the kids watching preview tapes and everything yes. and and all the work they'd done and the fact that they'd already made these massively successful shows which sold all over the world yeah we knew this was going to be a massive hit yes we knew it yeah yeah and how did you get on with the other Teletubbies? You were, uh, you were, you were like family, was it? Or we we got on well. Yeah. I mean, we all went through this journey together. Yes. Um, but I, um, in order to for me to say more yeah. about getting on with the other Teletubbies, um, we need to go on to an, a, a, a level of payment. I understand. <laughs> I understand. I understood. All right. Then the rabbits. How did you get on with the rabbits? Oh, the rabbits. They yeah. were. <laughs> They were so awkward. Yeah. Uh, no, the rabbits were, um, they, they were Belgian eating rabbits. Were they? Because we were all So they ate big. Belgians? Um, well, <laughs> they didn't eat Belgians. I right. think that they ate lettuce. Right. But uh, they were from, they were imported from Belgium. Yeah. Because people would think, like when people meet me, even now, they expect me to be really small. Right. You know, they think that um, I'm short, I'll be but short you are, you because are they're a man tiny. Of, you are a man of stature. And I, I'm six foot three, yeah, yes. one point nine two meters. Yeah. So, um, and it's because of the camera angles, I the see. way it's filmed. Yeah. They, they, so, because so, the children imagine the Teletubbies are going to be small. Yes. Um, and um, that so, so the rabbits had to be as big as possible. Right. So that they wouldn't. Would yeah, make so it looked disproportionately. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's why they used to import these Belgian massive rabbits. Massive rabbits. Yeah, they're yeah. huge. Yeah. So then, um, just a couple more questions. What were the biggest challenges for you uh, uh, in, in the performance um, aspect? The biggest challenges were dealing with the people. Really. Yeah. Dealing with the people. It's the same as doing stand-up comedy. It's not getting in front of the audience and telling the jokes. Yeah. It's dealing with the people that you have to deal with to yeah. get. To the stage in yeah. front of the audience, yeah. and those were the challenges. I was up to the job. I was um, practicing Aikido. I did yoga regularly. Yeah. I was incredibly fit. Yeah. I yeah. would turn up to the set early and do yoga and key breathing. Yeah. Uh, I was much fitter than any of the others, even though I was the oldest. Yes. I took all the physical risks yeah. because sometimes it was a bit of a risk, and, and they were too scared to do it, and I, t I took the risks. Yeah. Um, that was no challenge at all. Yes. But dealing with the powers that yeah, be okay. uh, and the people who make the decisions and control yes. stuff, yeah. that was the biggest challenge, yep. obviously, ultimately, because they fired me. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. And, and perhaps a sort of a, a stepping back a little bit, do, would you have any advice to anyone who would want to get into something like this costume performance or ha either how to get in or what skills or what you might want to need to think about to prepare yourself to be something like this? Um, well, I think it's all changed now because people don't really get repeat fees very much anymore. Okay. Um, and also that be aware that if you're doing that costume performance, yeah. it's not you, it's the costume yeah. that's famous. Yes. And there's a rule in show business, everybody can be replaced. Okay. Even Elvis Presley can be replaced yeah. with Elvis Presley yes. imitators. Yes. So um, nobody's job is really safe. Yeah. But if you're doing a costume work, yeah. your job is even more unsafe. Yes. So don't be too high maintenance. Okay. Because they'll fire you. Yes. Not that I was high maintenance. No. But you no. can be. They say that you know a squeaky hinge gets most oil. Yeah. But uh, unless you're already famous, don't be a squeaky hinge. Right. Right. Uh, and if you can get out the costume and get your face on screen. Yes. Because that's the only way you've got a chance of uh, lasting a bit longer. Yeah. And uh, keep all your money and put it into property. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what's next for you? So you've got a. I know that you, you're 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 out there. You're um, you're often in Hungary uh, mm. with the stand up in yeah. the UK. Have you got any particular gigs or anything anything particular coming up? Well, I'm excited about going to South Africa okay. on the first of January. Yeah, I'm doing uh, Johannesburg. I'm doing two different venues in Johannesburg. Yes, going on early in one and then finishing closing the show in the other one. Right. And having a, a mad dash between the two venues. Yes. And then going on to Cape Town after having done a few around Johannesburg. Yeah. Uh, headlining the main comedy club in Cape Town, which I think is called the Cape Town Comedy Club. Yeah. And I'm hoping to even get on a beach and lie on a sun lounger and maybe read a book. Yeah. And have a swim in the sea. Yeah. You're still up with Harry from time to time? Yeah, I see. He did yeah. actually inquire about whether I was available to do some dates, uh, to do about five dates with him last week. But then... Um, he didn't use me in the end. Yeah, yeah. 
Well then, thank you very much indeed. It's been terrific to have you on the podcast today. Thank so you. Thank, thank you very much indeed for joining us. I can't recommend Dave's stand-up performances enough. So do try and catch them if he's playing near you. And also his book, The Sex Life of a Comedian, is available on Amazon. Uh, I've been Steve Collison here with Dave Thompson on the filmsetgeek.com podcast. Thanks for listening and goodbye. Goodbye. Thanks and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks and goodbye. Thank you. (laughs)